My name's Chris Greenack. I work at AWS. I uh, work with the partner organization here. Uh, you might not know the company uh, AWS has sort of two sides, the commercial side and the partner side. They're both about equal in, in revenue and probably uh, support. Uh, we spend a little bit more time uh, with certain customers um, uh, because they tend to uh, do certain things uh, that help us promote AWS as a business. So we work a lot with ISVs, independent uh, software vendors, and consulting partners that are all in on AWS. My role in that organization is a uh, solutions architect, and I'm the global segment leader for machine learning. What that means is I go around the world and I get to see what absolutely everybody's doing with machine learning. And because AWS is customer obsessed and we really derive most of our inspiration for all the tools that uh, you've had exposure to today, um, it's really important to listen to the customer. So uh, that's what I get to do. I get to listen to customers, uh, sort of translate a lot of that work with the service teams here occasionally, new products, new features, et cetera, come out of that. And we have been extremely impressed with SIFT Science, and that's why we're here today with this dialogue. So if you don't mind, oh, background, uh, I'm a mathematician, went to NYU, worked at Goldman Sachs as a quantitative strategist for about eight years, then sort of traveled around the world, shown other people how to crash markets with that technology. Came here and became an entrepreneur, like all of you, uh, had a number of notable failures, but also two at least fantastic exits. About four or five years ago, I was working at GoPro, and uh, we were doing computer vision. If you have a GoPro, you might know uh, about this program that automatically edits videos for you. Um, so I was working on a lot of software that had to run uh, doing machine learning, computer vision, um, that worked on the camera, worked on the phone, worked in the cloud. Uh, and almost any platform. So it was IoT, it was cloud, it was uh, Windows and, and Mac. Really got full exposure. Now we were doing TensorFlow back then and never once did any one of us, it, it did occur to us to call that artificial intelligence. Now of course that's what we call it. Um, a lot of my good friends as the stock price went from 90 to 6 uh, started leaving and all the good ones came to AWS. And uh, eventually I responded to one of those phone calls. So that's, that's how I ended up getting here. And it's been a great ride. So that's my background. Jason, uh, why don't you tell us about yourself? I'm Jason. Thank you all so much for making the time on a busy Monday night. Uh, I feel very unworthy of your time, but hopefully I'll <laughs> prove to be. Um, so let's see, uh, computer science undergrad from the University of Washington, graduated in 2006. Worked at a software, as a software engineer at a bunch of startups in Seattle, uh, most notably Zillow. I was there when they were less than 60 people. Was fortunate to ride that rocket ship for a while. Um, and then worked at a bunch of other startups. And then in 2011, moved down to San Francisco to start SIF Science. We went through Y Combinator in the summer of 2011. Uh, since then, we've raised about $112 million of funding with investors like Max Levchin, Union Square Ventures, Spark Capital, Insight Venture Partners, and most recently, um, Stripes Group. We are in the business of democratizing uh, world-class fraud detection through the same machine learning techniques that you would find at Amazon and Google and Facebook. Uh, we think that most businesses in the world don't have the tools and the um, technical capabilities to build those types of systems in-house. So we want to make it easy for, for them to protect their own business from bad actors like uh, you know, people using stolen credit cards, creating fake accounts, um, stealing, stealing other people's passwords, and uh, you know, posting spammy content and scamming others. There's a lot of um, our thesis is that as, as everything moves online, so will all these different types of uh, bad behaviors, and someone needs to um, build a, a protective uh, force field for, for the internet. And maybe just a little bit about your, your background as uh, an entrepreneur. I'm sure that SIFT wasn't your first company, or was it? it, it was, that was my first company okay. that I started. Um, I, previously, I was um, part of the founding team uh, for a small company in Seattle called Buzz Labs that was aqua hired by IAC. But yeah, SIFT was the first company that we started from the ground up. And I would say that, um, you know, as an engineer, one of the great delights is that software is highly uh, predictable and deterministic, and you know, bits and bytes are, are um, consistent and uh, debuggable. Uh, and and you, when you're building a company, uh, one of the interesting lessons and uh, variables you have to deal with are people, because people are highly, uh, you know, emotional, uh, irrational, inconsistent. 
but it also makes it really fun. I think that the joy of building a team and scaling a team and learning how to um, design the software and the operating system of the company um, actually is, is one of the things I think a lot about, um, applying lessons learned from designing great software to designing a great business and company. And Y Combinator, uh, tell us about that experience there. Yeah, so Y Combinator, just for those who, who don't know, um, it's an incubator uh, down in Palo Alto. Um, they have two batches every summer and winter where they accept you know, dozens of startups that are usually in the, in the very early stage and they try to um, give you some fundamentals and, and kind of put you through this intensive three month boot camp. Um, and, and you know, there's a lot of things in the early years of a business that you shouldn't have to think about. Um, legal paperwork and corporation and you know, they, they really try to take care of all of that for you so that you can focus on finding product market fit and building a, um, something that people want. That's, that's the motto of YC, build something that people want. And so, you know, we went through that in the summer of 2011. Um, ironically, we were one of the businesses that actually didn't have any idea what we were going to do. When we got into YC, we had uh, a couple of different options about what we could build as a company. Um, three of them were consumer businesses, two of them were B2B enterprise businesses. Um, but over the course of the first few weeks of YC, um, we got a lot of great advice that this, this idea of uh, democratizing machine learning as a service specifically applied to fraud detection was going to be valuable. And, and um, so we, uh, you know, we, it was hard to say no to these very esteemed smart people like Paul Graham and Sam Altman. And so uh, down the path we went, and it's seven years later, um, it's proven to be um, pretty, pretty successful so far. So initially, you didn't know it was going to be fraud detection. You know, I mean, how, what was the inspiration? Yeah, so we knew we wanted to do something with machine learning. That was the big hypothesis back then. It was like, hey, machine learning is going to disrupt a lot of different industries. What's a problem that makes sense to apply machine learning to? Which is kind of unintuitive. I think a lot of great entrepreneurs that I respect start off with a great problem, and then they go find the right solution. We knew we wanted to do something with machine learning, and we went in reverse searching for the problem. Uh, and so we asked a bunch of our friends that worked at business tech, tech businesses, hey, what are some challenges that your company is facing today that you don't want to deal with yourself? And fraud came up as a common recurring theme. And um, we literally did not know anything about fraud at the time. I, I, I had to go Google what a chargeback was and, and understand the whole system. Um, so you know, it was a, a very new world for us, but I think because we didn't have any of the pre-existing baggage and knowledge associated with the industry as is, we were able to open up um, and, and attack this um, domain with a fresh pair of um, eyes. And, and that's really helped in terms of how we go to market, how we build a product, how we sell it, et cetera. So um, of course, you're not the only one in the field. And there was fraud detection prior to even the renaissance in uh, machine learning. So what is it that makes SIF different? How do you differentiate yourself uh, from not only uh, the legacy players in this market, but the upstarts as well? Yeah. So, so, so there, there's a lot of competition. That's something that's been really um, exciting and also challenging. I think it's exciting because it means that there's a big market opportunity at stake. Everyone's really excited about the prize to be won. That's challenging because when there's a lot of competition, there's a lot of uh, noise, there's a lot of you know, uh, uh, just distraction. Uh, you have to outspend, outmarket, outcompete. But in terms of our differentiators, um, the first dimension I think about is just the technology itself. So the, the legacy way of solving this problem uh, is primarily through rules-based systems that are highly reactive, unscalable, difficult to maintain as you grow your business. Um, you know, I, the, the analogy I use here is airport security. A lot of the internet operates like airport security, right? You know, you just typed in your password 20 minutes ago. Why do you have to type it in again? You, you have to um, answer a phone call from a customer support person proving you are who you, who you say you are. You have to fill out a capture that you pro to prove that you're not a robot. All these barriers and friction points um, are li largely a result of the lack of the right technology approach to this problem, right? That's the, the rules-based systems. And so we're trying to modernize this industry and bring, again, the, the, the level of um, uh, capability and solution that we've seen ourselves working at Amazon or Google and other big technology companies, how do we democratize and make that easy for the rest of the, the world to, to plug into? Um, that's the first dimension. The second dimension is that uh, over the past few years, we've really evolved from uh, an initial focus of, on credit card fraud to becoming a more broad um, trust and safety platform where you know, we now have four different products. If you look at our website, there's 
you know, payment fraud uh, um, prevention, but then there's also uh, account takeover prevention, uh, you know, fake content prevention, fake, fake um, accounts prevention. And so we've really had this um, foundational approach to building the technology since day one and, and this idea that we could be a lot broader um, and as um, enterprises especially grow and, and attack new verticals and new geographies um, and launch new products, they don't want to have uh, five different point solutions for each of their different types of fraud problems. They want to have one platform that can scale with them every step of the way. So I've often said in machine learning, machine learning you can only do three things. Uh, predict a number, a class, or discover uh, a group in a cluster. Um, are you, would you say that that's true <clears throat> in the fraud business? And I mean, is it about detection or prediction? I would say we focused on the prediction first. And then we have rounded out by building capabilities to take action. Mm. That's been the big thing is that you know, machine learning at the end of the day is just a score <laughs> saying, hey, you know, take a look at this thing that's suspicious. But in terms of actually doing something about it, which is what our customers really need to do, they can't just get an alarm. They need to be able to block the person from stealing a password or creating a fake account or using a stolen credit card. We've rounded out our product suite and capabilities with a bunch of um, workflow and, and uh, sort of API hook capabilities that uh, becomes a powerful one-two punch with the accuracy of our machine learning. So just one more question on you know, entrepreneuring as a machine learning uh, practitioner. Um, I'm sure a lot of folks in the audience, we just kicked off our two-day uh, immersion in machine learning. Um, what sort of guidance uh, would you offer to an entrepreneur who wants to be uh, in the machine learning field? Yeah, um, this is something that I thought a lot about because I've seen a lot of interesting businesses, but also a lot of not so interesting businesses. I, I think the, one of the first mistakes I often see is um, too much of the dream up front. There's often a propensity to build this very broad-based um, you know, machine learning as a service that can solve any problem for anyone, anytime. And I think that, uh, in my experience at least, working with businesses, um, most businesses do not have the capability to understand what that even means. And they want to buy something that solves a very real problem for themselves right now. Like, I, I would strongly advise that unless you are, you know, Google or Amazon or, you know, Microsoft that can offer some very broad based platform and do that very well, um, I would focus instead on a very narrow, specific, real pain point and solve that first because um, the, the buyer of your solution and the customers that you're serving don't think so broadly. They, they're not often engineers or they, you know, they, they only have so much budget and timeline to implement something. And so if it's too abstract, you're gonna find yourself in a hole. Um, the second thing I would say is that there's often um, you know, an overemphasis on hiring data scientists. We hired our first data scientist literally like six months ago. After seven years in the company, 170 people in, um, I would strongly urge that before you really go on a data scientist hiring spree, you have a um, really strong data infrastructure in place. Whether you build it in-house or you are using someone else's services, make sure you have that data infrastructure in place such that when you hire data scientists, they can go to town on that data and without having to prod and poke an engineer to get that data for them. So, so having the rails to unlock your data um, is, is really important before you go looking for a bunch of data scientists. I also like the joke, There's, there was one slide famously like, a data scientist is a statistician that lives in San Francisco. Um, <laughs> yeah, it, it's, it, it, but, but just, I think, I think, be careful of all the buzz and like, just try to think for yourself from first principles. Um, the third thing I would say, there's a lot of players in any machine learning, like there's machine learning for X a thousand times over, it has become nuts. And I think for a lot of you all who are, are maybe more engineering types, it can be maddening and frustrating to have to play the marketing game, um, but you gotta play it. And, and I think we continue to find ways that we need to compete better and, and tell our story better. Um, so if you're starting a business in the machine learning space, get used to explaining yourself, get used to um, trying to articulate crisply and precisely why, why are you special? Why should a customer buy you right now? Um, because it's, it's not changing. These, these folks are not going away. It's only gonna get more crowded. Great, great advice, thank you. Um, if you don't mind, I'll just add one thing to that. I think the one, the most overrated and most 
uh, misunderstood or least understood part of machine learning is that it's about the algorithms. Uh, it's not. It's about the data. I frequently begin a lot of my presentations with, if you have no code, then uh, if you have no data, then you will have no code. If you have bad data, then you're going to have bad code. If you have good data, then you can begin because now data writes code. Yeah. Uh, what comes along with that is the bias that is inherent in a lot of our data sources. Uh, I wonder what kind of bias are you seeing in our, our data? Human uh, influence bias, uh, machine influence bias, collection bias? I mean, what are you actually seeing within it? Yeah, I mean, I think there's biases across all dimensions. Um, I'll, I'll share a funny example. Um, we, we operate, we, one of our customers is an uh, Asian focused dating. Um, site. I won't say who, but uh, <laughs> the members are predominantly Asian. And one of the f um, fields that they send us in the integration is a Boolean field that that's, um, has Asian face, which is like a reference to the profile picture. Does it have an Asian face? And we're trying to predict and classify whether someone is fraudulent or not. And so we've learned from the data set that if has Asian face is false, if they do not have an Asian face, face, they're more likely to be a fraudster, which kind of intuitively makes sense, right, given that you know, it's, it's predominantly Asian meeting other Asians. But I just think that you know, it's, it's a trivial but con and, uh, and contrite example, but it speaks to just a larger issue that um, when you're building a machine learning system, it's like teaching a child to learn, right? And there's going to be biases inherent in how you raise your children and um, what you expose them to and how you interact with them, what kind of feedback you give them. Um, all of that carries over from the human world to um, the software world. And so being very mindful of uh, you know, everything from you know, the, the initial training set to you know, the humans that are labeling and providing feedback, um, and then when it's getting exposed to the real world, who is out there um, you know, using that service and, what, and, and, and uh, how you iterate based on that feedback, I think all this needs to be taken into account as you, um, as you build. And I would say we are far from perfect. I think this is something we're continuing to, to um, iterate upon as we uh, grow our customer base and, and recognize that we um, have certain gaps in our knowledge, right? So a concrete example is right now 70% um, of our customer base is in the US, 30% is, is outside. You can bet that the kinds of fraud that we are predicting and learning from have certain propensities associated to US specific types of behaviors and information versus um, international. And so we need to uh, you know, account for that, make sure that we're not overfitting or underfitting and, and whatnot. About 80% of the time and money, for that matter, that's spent doing data science is cleaning the data, data wrangling. Uh, how much bias do you think is influenced you know, by the data scientists, the developers at that, at that phase? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of this um, comes back to how you train your people to, to be aware of their biases. And uh, I would say that we're, we're far from perfect in this field as, as well. We, we, we're, we're barely keeping up with the, custom, with the growth of our customers. In some ways, we have to handle the derivative of their traffic. When they have traffic spikes, we have to be able to horizontally scale without missing a beat. So I'm sure that there are lots of biases as, um, as we collect data. We're, we're, we're still um, doing a lot just to keep up. Are there examples where human-induced bias can, can occur, either deliberately or through negligence? Yeah, I mean, I would say um, in, in the media, I don't know if you guys remember, maybe like two years ago, uh, Microsoft released this Twitter chatbot called Tay, and uh, it was supposed to be this innocent experiment, but then some very motivated, so small set of user base um, interacted with this chatbot and taught it to be effectively very, very, very racist. Mm -hmm. um, and again, this goes back to the earlier point that machine learning is like raising a child. And you know, it depends on the inputs that it's, it's, it's exposed to and the interactions it has with the real world. But uh, you know, ch I believe that children are not born with biases. I think that it's, um, it's more of a nature than, or sorry, it's more nurture than it is nature. So to extend that metaphor, which is entirely appropriate, how do machines learn to be biased? Yeah, I mean, I think there's different elements, right? So if, if especially in the classification domain where you're learning off of labeled data, what types of labeled data is being fed into the system? Um, there was a blog post recently famously talking about um, you know, the ImageNet uh, you know, image classification training set and how uh, 
you know, feeding it pictures of people cooking, um, there was actually a bias where like 64% of the images had women cooking. And so then it learned, oh, you know, this, per this, this gender is, is going to be cooking more, it actually amplifies that bias in its learning process. So that's like on the training set side. Then there's, you know, as it interacts with the real world um, and, and gets exposed to what's out there, there's, um, you know, uh, biases inherent in the people that interact with it, making sure that it's a, it's a true sample, um, a truly diverse sample. I mean, this is a really hard problem. And you're seeing, like, you know, uh, just, just to bring up something that's on, the, on top of news, is like fake news, right? Like, Facebook is investing 8,000 people. They're trying to hire 8,000 people over the next year or two to, to fight a lot of the biases that are inherent in their systems, right? That um, their systems are over amplifying the wrong type of content and not. Um, taking a, a unbiased view. So, um, you know, uh, Stephen Colbert, you know, before he had his uh, talk show where he, I guess he could be himself, he was this conservative commentator, and one of his jokes was reality has a liberal bias. Um, so if we can't even see our own bias, how can we prevent our machines from developing biases? There are programs in almost every large enterprise to see uh, your unconscious bias and be aware that it's out there, at least elevate that knowledge. And maybe uh, another corollary there is what responsibility do we have as entrepreneurs and um, executives who are making these product management decisions to filter that bias out or to actually actively uh, encode some uh, anti-bias into the uh, algorithms. Yeah, I mean, I, I think this is this is a, the grand question of life, right? How do you achieve the highest level of consciousness for yourself, <laughs> and then for what you uh, what you yeah. what you produce, whether it's your children, whether it's technology? I wish I could. I I, I was already there. Um, I'm not. But I think in terms of responsibility, I think that uh, as technology businesses become more powerful than many aggregate uh, aggregates of nations in the world there's even more power and accountability that needs to be held towards the Facebooks, the Amazons, the Googles, because there's such a concentration of this uh, power and, and, and ability to um, make decisions that change the landscape of an election. I worry about the intersection of law and you know, how we design our, our constitution and the internet. And the internet is borderless, which is one of the most fantastic things that's come out of the last you know, two decades is that you're connecting countries and people all over the world. But these businesses that have all the power are not held to the same standard that we hold our government to in some ways. Mm -hmm. What is going to happen to change that? And taking it one step further, you know, the lawmakers, most, I mean, if you guys watch the, uh, the, the, the trial with uh, Zuckerberg, Zuckerberg it was, yeah. it was a joke. It was like <laughs> nine out of 10 questions were like, you know, something that I think a first grader could have answered today. Um, and so, you know, how do we elect people that have enough uh, digital literacy to reason about data, privacy, and ownership, and rights? Mm -hmm. how, do we, how do we get those people into the right positions of office so that they can help uh, watch the watchdogs? One use case that I like to talk about is uh, market segmentation. Every company has a transaction log. Every transaction log can be clustered. So you can develop algorithmic personas or market segmentation, and that's what we do, right? That's a, 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 that's a horizontal use case. Every company can do better understand their customer. In the process of doing that, they buy ads. And let's say you want to hire, right? We're at a full employment rate right now. It's very difficult to hire. And thanks to your market segmentation, you know that uh, women between the age of 27 and 32 will apply for a particular job, right? So you know the, these ads show up on, uh, on that narrow demographics, Facebook pages, et cetera, Google searches. What if a perfectly qualified man, 48, is looking for that exact same kind of job. I mean, this is a perfectly valid use uh, in the interest of the company to use machine learning and conceivably unbiased data, right? But perhaps, I mean, is that ageism uh, that might have crept into the use of the technology? This goes back to the trainings. I, I, having um, <clears throat> visibility into how that decision was made to serve that particular ad at that time, that's actually, abstracting that to, to me it's one of the great um, 
things to unlock with this new wave of machine learning is that there needs to be transparency and visibility into the set of variables and inputs and computations that led to that outcome. This is actually the crazier part is that you know, all the rave about deep learning algorithms and really fancy neural nets, that just adds more and more to the black box nature. Mm -hmm. Actually for our business, this is something that we, we um, struggle with. Like we have historically um, focused mostly on just really basic stuff. Naive Bayes, logistic regression, random force. These are highly explainable algorithms. Customers can um, see more, more than they can't how that outcome and decision was made. And so, you know, I think uh, in the case of what you just brought up, we need to ideally have frameworks and ways to visualize and understand where the biases were introduced, if any. Mm -hmm. And I mean, eventually you're going to have court cases where you have to show how this decision was arrived, right? Self-driving cars, you, you can imagine that, you know, as that becomes a standard and there's, you know, accidents and deaths, there's going to have to be some prosecution of that, right? So it's, we're going to, we're living in interesting times. I was just at Duke University this weekend and there was a debate about whether that in, in fact can or should be legislated that just because you have an ad out there and you've targeted a demographic for it, uh, you know, should you be legally required to put that ad on, you know, on, on everybody's Facebook, which is a sort of an odd question, but it is beginning to, to be asked. So I guess the question is, is machine learning helping us or hurting us in this regard? We found ourselves in a, a narrow cubby hole here uh, with all the right intentions, um, but, and, and all, you know, hoping for the best outcomes, but how do you avoid something like this? Yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I'm gonna give the cheesy cop-out answer, which is that I think, <laughs> Every piece of technology, I'll, I'll quote Uncle Ben from Spider-Man, you know, <laughs> with, with great power comes great responsibility. Every piece of technology has the potential to do, to, to deliver incredible benefit, but it can also deliver incredible harm. It depends on how it's wielded, by whom, or the incentives. This is why, to me, it's very fascinating to look at initiatives like OpenAI. You know, they're taking this very long-term bet to protect against the, the possibility that, you know, there will be a concentration of AGI amongst people who don't have the, the best possible uh, intent for humanity, and they want to make that type of technology and uh, advancement available to the general public. And so, you know, it's, it's going to be a continuing arms race, right. and, and it, it just depends on who's, who's in charge. Um, you know, you don't have to go to our legislators to find ignorance on computer science. Uh, if you ask most uh, data scientists, computer scientists, what data is, they'll usually tell you that it's something that you type in the empty spaces on a web page or comes out of a log. But every one of you brought your phone here tonight, right? So you're all giving me your Bluetooth advertisement, which I can capture. I can see you. There's two cameras on my phone. There's one on each of our phones. You can hear me, right? So audio, radio signal, all of this is data now. And it's not quite in our consciousness yet that this is true. But this is data. We can use computer vision with uh, convolutional neural networks, et cetera. The same thing with um, media and audio. And even heuristic algorithms now are taking uh, the, you know, these various signals that we have and creating correlations that weren't there before. I'm sure a lot of the entrepreneurs here uh, in the room tonight are intending to start companies like this. So here's the question. Uh, when do you start thinking about these problems as an entrepreneur? Um, I mean, I'll tell you what I've said to a lot of folks. If it feels creepy, it's probably going to get legislated. <laughs> but I wonder what your thoughts are. I mean, where in the, in, the, in the entrepreneur life cycle should you start to be concerned about these things? I've thought about this since day one. I, I, I wrote myself a little piece of JavaScript snippet that does what's called device fingerprinting. Device fingerprinting collects attributes off of your laptop, like the font installed, the browser size and window, the locale, all that, and you know, compiles it into something that's like a, a fuzzy um, uh, hash to try to uniquely identify your device. Now, that sounds creepy, but I can tell you that um, is one of the most important signals to helping identify fraudsters, because fraudsters mm -hmm. will often use one laptop and create multiple accounts using different email addresses or different you know, browsers, different IP addresses from that one laptop. And so if you can quickly link that, all those accounts to the same device, you're able to stop fraud more effectively. But what's the flip side of this? The flip side is that 
device fingerprints, fingerprints are also very um, effective for targeted advertising, right? It's the, it's, there's, it goes back to what I said earlier. That with, there's always two sides to every um, story. And for us, you know, as I run in Stiff Science, I'm very committed to running um, the business in a way that you know, I myself as a user of the internet would be proud to, to be a part of. You know, we don't have any intention ever uh, to sell data to a third party or to advertise against it or do anything creepy. We only want to help our customers protect against bad actors. And so this is where a lot of the legislation um, needs to, I think, take this into account because it can't just be throwing out the baby with the bathwater. You need to think more carefully about how will that data be used for what purposes. And you know, I think in this in the spirit, and this is self-serving to be to be clear, but I think it's it's a it's a well reasoned reason argument that in this in the space of fraud detection, um, being able to share intelligence across our customer network is actually really beneficial to all parties involved. There's sort of a neighborhood watch aspect. So the uh, topic, the title of our talk tonight is designing mindful machines. Uh, mindfulness is not something that is typically associated with algorithm development, coding, et cetera. Can you tell me what your uh, thoughts are on what that means? What is a well-designed mindful machine? Yeah, I mean, I think it goes back to that, that uh, grand question of consciousness, right? Are you, are you aware of the biases that you are incorporating into the software you build? Um, and, and whether it's... <laughs> the way you do something is the way you do anything. The, the Zen and the art of motorcycle maintenance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I think we have to take responsibility for the software we build and the outcomes that they drive, whether they're positive or negative. And I think you know, you're seeing a, a kind of a, a reckoning, in, in especially with you know, the Facebooks and, and Googles and Amazons. Um, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. I think for all of you entrepreneurs, like, this, you know, the, the public is no longer going to be ignorant against, um, you know, uh, our excuses. We need to do better, and we must, because engineers have this incredible new superpower, right? We can serve millions of people with, you know, from, from a garage, right? Like, this idea that we, you know, we, we are not um, absolved of our responsibility, that's, that's no longer fair game in, the, in this next decade. And, and are, are there any practices that you have? Because you know you're spending your purpose of your company is to find bad guys. Uh, they conceivably have don't don't have that respect that you're reflecting right here. Um, I mean, is there anything that you do personally to to sort of bring that to your work every day? Um, I mean, I do I do meditation, but that's like outside of work. I, I, I do want to actually harp on one thing for us, which has been a struggle, which is I'm actually prosecuting a lot of my friends. So a concrete example is that. You know, I've had friends come to me and say, oh, yeah, you know, this business, they had this promo code program where if you refer a friend, you get 10 bucks off the first use of that service, right? How do you game a system like that? You create multiple accounts, and then you have a bunch of referral codes that funnel into one master account, and then all of a sudden, this master account gets $100 off instead of $10 off. And I've literally had friends be like, oh, this customer, I used to be able to take advantage of them this way. But then now, all of a sudden, I can't. And it's because we were able to help stop that. And drawing the gradient of morality and you know, defining what is good and what is bad, I've come to learn over the last seven years is really, really hard. It means different things to different people and, and to, around the world, depending on the vertical you're in, depending on what size your business is in or your culture. Like, it's, it's a fascinating, so I've become more mindful of the fact that humanity is complex and, and uh, not black and white at all. I do want to talk about scale to contrast uh, you know, the entrepreneurs in the room now to look at the, the large corporations. We can point to many instances over the past few years of uh, failures, right? Uh, everything from Google's trend detection to facial detection, Facebook, et cetera. What happens? How is it different at scale when a problem is that large? I mean, that's conceivably why Zuck went uh, before the um, senators for that grilling. Uh, how, how can you stop it when it's at that scale? You know, with automation, you get the efficiency, but you get efficiently accurate results and then also efficiently ac inaccurate results. And uh, rolling back some of these widespread outcomes, are, I think it's really hard. Um, I think this is where legislation is probably going to step in and start um, 
mandating some set of you know parameters uh, and, and constraints before some widespread decision could be made at, at, um, and, and impact so many lives. But it's it, it's going to slow things down too, right? And so um, you know you you kind of have to either live, be willing to move fast and break things, or move slowly and get things right. And ideally, you could move fast and get things right, but I, I don't think it's it's possible. So I'd, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask everyone to please t do a search for the Amazon leadership principles. I think as an institution, Amazon has a model for others to uh, replicate. Uh, it's just a search for Amazon leadership principles. So we've covered a little bit of bias in uh, gender and racial. I brought up ageism. Where else uh, should we be sensitive to gaps in bias? I think that I'll, I'll tie this back to a larger topic in Silicon Valley, which is around diversity. And diversity often um, is harped on, and as it should be, for the most obvious dimensions of gender and you know uh, race and religion. But I think it's also you know important to consider things that are not so obvious, like us, is someone an extrovert or an introvert? You know, how do they like to communicate? Are they do they write? Do they like to um, speak out loud? You know, are they oriented towards presentations or something? Like, diversity comes in so many shapes and sizes, and you'd be surprised if you could name all the ways in which you were um, biased or not. Like, it, it is, I think, a lifelong journey to understand how much uh, of our upbringing and, and our environment has really influenced um, how, we, how we think about the world today. Um, and, and so watching out for that echo chamber I think it's going to result. If we, the more we can be aware of that, it's, it's a better world for all, us all. So on awareness, uh, education, right? Um, you know, I, I like to use this phrase, uh, "data rights code," because it really does now, right? I mean, that is that is essentially what we're doing, um, and that's an education key that I use for developers, right? But what other messages? I mean, what responsibility do we have as developers in the machine learning space to educate and bring everyone into uh, recognizing the myths and the power of effective machine learning? Yeah, I, I would actually say it's not just about effective machine learning. I think it's about this phrase, dig digital literacy. Like, yeah. does your grandmother understand that when she interacts with a website, she is handing over some data implicitly, and that data could be sold to a third party? Like, does she even know that that's a possibility? Mm -hmm. Does she understand the basics of HTTP? And I do wonder, like, what can we do as developers to um, be more transparent, to be more accessible with the products that we build? Um, because technology is the new foundation for everything, right? And so um, we, we, we want to have an, an uh, equal, I think we want to have an equal access kind of culture and, and society, but it requires an equal amount of literacy as to how technology works. Do you think GDPR is a reaction to this? I mean, to a reaction that, you know, most grandmothers don't know what's happening with their cookies? Yeah, I think GDPR is a I mean, <laughs> That was an unintentional uh, pun there. Yeah, so, so, so G, GDPR has been a, a pain for, for us, and I'm sure a lot of people in this room. And yeah, I think the spirit of it is well-intentioned. But it goes back to the nuances of, are there some use cases in which data collection and storage is more, accept, more uh, permissible than others? Mm -hmm. And ultimately, can we create a model of the internet such that it really is left up to individual users to own and set the permissions for their individual pieces of data, right? Like ultimately, that would be the the right way. I think the internet could work, but uh, we're so far opposite on that right now. I think, we're, especially this next generation of, of Gen Gen Z and whatever Gen, is after Gen Z, they, they they seem to not care at all who collects their data, and, and it has me worried. Yeah, I think the next generation is going to be generation micro segmented. Yeah. Um, so GDPR, in case uh, you don't know, is the European legislation that gives every European citizen the right to delete all of their information from any website, any uh, app, et cetera, that they use. So that's what GDPR stands for. So you had a question. We'll start with you. we got 15 minutes. So if I look at a couple of large recent stumbles, um, Uber, the $60 billion company, hit a bunch of scandals, maybe dropped to 50, and it's still rising. No, no. No problem hiring employees, getting customers, et cetera. Facebook, maybe 600 billion, drop to 500. Again, hiring, you know, growing, et cetera. So uh, it's, it's almost like the message is get success first and worry about everything else later. Comments? I think this, 
goes back to who pays the bills and you know the VCs and the investors um, on, who, are, who sit on the boards of these companies, uh, I think could, could do more to um, scrutinize and uh, hold the, the company's leadership uh, accountable for the decisions that they make. But I think we had to have some of these big stumbles in order for there to be at least awareness that there, there's all this bad crap is happening. And then I think there's going to still be a few more stumbles with even bigger penalties and damages un until, I, until this becomes legislated. I don't think we're going to see the, the, the um, change at the magnitude and, and, and velocity that we need to see. It just, you know, human nature is to only wait until the last possible moment, the, 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 until it's the most painful to actually respond to it. So it was great to hear what you said. And uh, I was wondering, uh, you know, the bias evidence has been along for many centuries. So the opportunity to create products to combat that has been around. So for example, when we've had cars, we also created roads. And, uh, and so do you feel as though there's an opportunity to create products in the area of uh, you know, normalizing the data before it's used versus mm. get, handing it to legislators who may never understand technology as well. Yeah, I, I think uh, there will continue to be a rising premium on clean, uh, uh, truthful, unbiased data. Um, and, and I think uh, there are actually some interesting businesses that have emerged in the last five years that focus on just just this problem. Like they, they try to produce label data sets for some problem domain and guarantee some sort of SLA around the, the cleanliness of it. So I think as, as the pain continues to be more and more real, everything up the value chain is going to uh, emerge uh, with, with, more, um, with higher standards. And if you don't mind uh, my adding to that, um, just from my point of view, um, yes, there's enormous opportunity here. This is early days in the machine learning re renaissance, right? We're just at the beginning of the crux where uh, Jeffrey Hinton's backpropagation on labeled data as a software technique met NVIDIA's combination of hardware to process this. And it's still very, very, very early days. You are way ahead of the pack because you showed up here, right? Uh, you know that uh, bad data leads to bad code because data writes code. Um, so it's still very early days. Um, there is going to be a much a, a growing audience for these kinds of products. And that's what I'm seeing every day when I meet with, you know, whether it's an S&P 100 company or a startup in Singapore. They're just now beginning to realize the value of the data that they have. And if you ask any data scientist why their stuff isn't working out yet, they all say the same thing. We don't have enough data. At what point do we give respect to each other? Like, for example, like you're talking about cookies. I know like my grandmother, and there's a lot of grandmothers out there that are no more sending $400 to some Nigerian prince for sending them money. Do we need to get involved into that equation too as potential users on a daily basis? Yes. I think that we're so far from that. I think that digital literacy should be a part of every elementary school. And, and there should be programs to get seniors who are coming onto the internet for the first time to be more uh, aware that that email they got from Bank of America may not be from Bank of America, yeah. right? Like we, we are still so early in the ability to um, have the everyday internet user be aware of what looks like a scam and what doesn't look like a scam. Now, on the flip side, there's also things that, you know, like if you look at Chrome, they've done some pretty interesting things around identifying, hey, this website is fishy. Do not you know, be very sure that you're clicking on the website. So there's things that we can do as technologists to help. But I think our, our user base needs to meet us halfway and get educated. And there's things that we can do, too, to help them get educated. But they have to um, sort of you know, have that curiosity, like, oh, crap, I, I, I can't just click on whatever's out there. Yeah, you know, I'll just add to that a little bit. Um, you know, there's always going to be bad guys out there. And they, they are in real life, and there are online, no doubt. One of the things that concerns me, and Jason, as an expert, I'd love to hear your comment. I think right now the bad guys have the upper hand. One of the things about machine learning, algorithms learning from data, is that once a breach, uh, you know, either it's fraud or anti-money laundering or any of these things, once it happens, you detect it, and the behavior stops. So machine learning algorithms aren't necessarily designed for that underlying assumption. So you know the bad guys kind of have an upper hand right now. I mean, number one, I guess, do you agree? 
Uh, and number two, you know, what can a common you know user do to sort of protect themselves in this situation? Yeah, I mean, bad guys. One one thing I think a lot about is that there's an asymmetry in security or protection, right? The bad guys only need to find one way in, and you as a business, you you need to protect all the possible entry points. Like that's really hard, right? And so I, I think um, you know they do have the upper hand, and and that, that's that's why. You know, business is good. <laughs> <laughs> nice. My question for you is concerning GDPR and CCPA. So you did talk about GDPR a little bit, but it, there is actually a lot more rules than just the right to delete your, I mean, in particular, there's things okay. about uh, rights against automated decision making and profiling, right to rectify, right to object, et cetera, et cetera. I'm, I'm curious as to your viewpoint, uh, how this affects machine learning as, as a um, practice, because you know, we're talking about potentially forced transparency due to these types of regulations. I think that uh, two things. One, I have a whole team that dealt, dealt with the GDPR stuff in detail, so I'm going to speak at a very high level. Two, transparency, I think, is a good thing. I think transparency helps drive trust and accountability, and I think that uh, especially as the stakes get higher for certain applications of machine learning, I, I, you know, self-driving cars or or not, it's going to be even more important than ever that there's ways to understand what what happened, right? And and I think um, you know we're just seeing the tip of the iceberg with things like GDPR. Now, going back to my earlier point, can we do so in a way that is still effective for everyone involved? It's a win-win because we don't want to add so much legislation that it stifles innovation at its core. It becomes impossible for a young startup to get off the ground because they don't have the resources to provide the transparency mandated by law. Whereas Google, or Amazon, or one of the, you know, these businesses have those resources available. Like they, we, we don't, we want to have an, as much of an equal playing field as possible, right? And I think machine learning is actually one of those few spaces where being an incumbent is an incredible position to be in because you have, uh, as, as he said, the data. You have all this data. It, it, let me just add a little color to, to, to your comment about machine learning in general, right? You can only do three things. You can predict a number, you can predict a class, or you can discover a group. I mean, you know, there's 5% in the, the whole literature that's outside of those three things, but it's regression, classification, and clustering. So forget the science fiction, right? This is what you do. Three great things, but look at the Rolling Stones. They had three great chords. Look at all the songs they wrote. So there's a lot you can do with it. I don't want to discount it, but it's not going to do everything. It is set, definitely not magic. It's not like a magic pill. So when you look at the complications that something like GDPR introduces, they're all virtuous, and they're, they're all true. I, I've called it the digital equiv equivalent of our uh, Fourth Amendment. But we're going to see how this plays out. It has the enormous capability to stifle innovation, uh, certainly, and to Paman's point uh, here earlier, you know, they want to grow first, satisfy uh, startups, want to satisfy their investors first, think about these consequences later. Maybe not so much. I mean, most ventures fail, and they can do it whether they're virtuous or not. So there's a lot that goes into it, but I, uh, well, one more thing. Uh, there's a great book out right now called Prediction Machines by A.J. Agrawal. I encourage everyone serious about machine learning to look at it. It's about the economics of AI. Um, whenever there's a breakthrough in economics, whenever something is made dramatically cheaper, in this case predictions, two things happen. The cost of complements go up and the cost of substitutes go down, right? So what are substitutes and complements, right? So uh, machine learning is all about prediction. Uh, think about coffee for a minute. If the price of coffee went from two bucks to 20 cents tomorrow, the price of cream and sugar would go up. They're complements. Consequently, the price of tea would go down. It's a substitute. What's going to happen when predictions are cheap, which is now, is that the complements of AI, of machine learning, are going to go up, right? And that is data. Right? And that's why we're talking about bias today. The value of data is going way up, especially ground truth data. Once your machine learning algorithms are in production, that is going to be the most valuable thing in the company. They can have 40 years of history as soon as that machine goes into production. The second thing is human judgment. We all know how good human judgment is, right? How many people called the 2016 election, right? Almost nobody, right? So that value is going to go down. Congratulations. But the uh, human judgment in machine learning is going to go way up. 
So these are the, some, of, some of the basic points in that book, and the economics of everything are important if you're a, a startup entrepreneur. I think we got time for uh, maybe two I'm, more I'm gonna questions. I'm going to call one last one. Chris, I won't want okay. to do that. What was one of your first challenges when you were starting, like, figuring out what you want to do with machine learning uh, when you what, did Y Combinator? Um, I don't know if the struggles were as pronounced on the business side. I think the struggle for me personally was uh, learning how to be a CEO. And uh, my first two years, I would, if I had to grade myself, I was probably like a, a C, C minus as a CEO or worse. Um, I think that you have to have a certain level of decisiveness and willingness to um, make hard decisions that are right for the business. And uh, for me, I, I struggle even to this day because um, I think I, I have a propensity to wanting um, there to be harmony amongst everyone, everyone to get along, to be happy. But sometimes you need to make decisions for the business that make some, some percentage of your company really unhappy. Um, and I think that's, you gotta get okay with that. So for the first two years, I, I punted on a lot of things that I wish I didn't because uh, I wish I had more courage to make those hard decisions. How did you figure out how to, um, I guess, like empower the people on your team at first? And like, what was the struggle like for that too? I think that as an engineer, at least for myself, I, I value this ability to build things and have a quick feedback loop and have something happen immediately. The impact, the feedback to impact is very high and uh, quick. And when you're building a company, you need to learn to do things through people. And so, um, you know, I'm still struggling with this today, but letting go and allowing mistakes to happen and, and not getting into this holier than thou mindset, like, oh, if I had done it, I would have done it better. So I'm a bit of a control freak. And uh, over the last seven years, gotten a lot of really good, tough feedback about how to micromanage less and, and, and delegate properly. Do they teach that in school? <laughs> Let's, let's do one more question, then we're, we're at the top of the hour, so yes, please. Yeah. Um, since my question actually is kind of like hypothetical, so since we cannot trust these companies with our data, right, and um, the rest of the world, most of the world is working on mobile devices, and these mobile devices are becoming very powerful, they're multi-core, octa-core, deca-core, and so forth coming up right now, right? So do you think in the future, since we cannot trust these companies to basically do no evil with our data, will some of the learning move more towards the device? on the device than actually taking the data and sending it to the cloud? My immediate answer was, isn't this exactly what Google is doing? I thought, I think, I think like with their latest Android release, so much of it is, is around this on-device learning. Like that's like half the... Apple maybe uh, before. Yeah, and so, so uh, I mean, I think the short answer is yes, we're gonna start to see these computers become more powerful than anything we could ever imagine and the learning is potentially self-contained. But I also think the other phenomenon is that Wi-Fi will become a blanket that covers everywhere, and it is in the best interest of these businesses to have, you know, cloud local copies of everything that's out there. And, you know, until until the incentives change and the legislation changes, I don't think we're going to see a significant change in that. Oh yeah! <laughs> Thank you very much, Jason. That was awesome. <laughs>